fuck that. I lived a very full life. Before. <laughs> what, what does that mean? Girl. <laughs> I've lived and I've and I've made my mistakes and I've made mistakes in the public eyes certainly as well but I hadn't all the things that I did when I was younger that young people should do. I was a mess. I was a mess, but I, I'm glad I got to be a mess. Laverne Cox is one of the most recognizable trans people in the world, maybe ever. She's an icon. And because of that, I think it's really easy to forget just how different things were in 2013 when Orange is a New Black first premiered. That was the show that put Laverne on the map, and also it helped her land the cover of Time magazine. So today we start off by talking about that Time cover, how prepared or not she felt to suddenly be in the center of the spotlight, and just how much things have changed since then. Because the very same year that Laverne was on the cover of Time, she was also on the cover of our magazine, The Advocate. We declared her the face of the movement. And now, in a really exciting way, Laverne Cox is not the only face of the trans movement. She's one of many. Now, just to note, this was recorded last fall for Luminary Media, so you will hear Laverne talk about the October 8th Supreme Court case with Amy Stevens, the one debating whether it's legal to discriminate against queer and trans people in the workplace. And as we know now, the Supreme Court ruled in our favor. Holy shit, right? The magnitude and impact of this, especially for those most of the margins in our community, it really can't be overstated. All right, let's get to the interview. From The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD, I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is LGBTQ and a I want to start with your Time magazine cover, if that's okay. Okay. In 2014, you were on the cover of Time, and mm-hmm. the headline said, The Transgender Tipping Point. Wow. I want to <laughs> know if you knew that that's what the headline was going to be and what your reaction was. It was a cover try, so I wasn't 100% sure I'd be on the cover. They told me if some news item happened that was really big, that I would be bumped from the cover. So I didn't know that the cover was happening until... I think the night before that it was happening for sure. I did know what the headline would be. The first time I saw the cover, a friend of mine named Precious Davis, who's a brilliant activist and human being, she lives in Chicago, she texted me a photo of the cover. And then um, it was um, the editor of Time premiered it on, like, I think Good Morning America, one of the morning shows that morning. And then it was, um, and I think that certainly changed my life. Wow. So what was your reaction to the transgender tipping point part of it? You know, it's I don't it's hard for me to separate my reaction in 2014 from the subsequent sort of reaction that my community has had to that title. There was so much criticism of, from my community of that title and the suggestion of that tipping point and criticism of the way the article was written and who was excluded and there was a lot of that and what I like about my community and what I appreciate about activists who are on the ground doing the work is that in their honesty they keep us accountable they keep us pushing to go further to be more inclusive to think differently and harder about who is being left out and what we're not talking about. So it's hard for me to separate my reaction um, of the tipping point moment from sort of the criticism and the critical interrogation of that moment. Um, my friend Jen Richards, we um, did a panel for Variety magazine um, a, a year ago about um, trans representation in, in the media, and for, specifically for trans actors. And she, what she said is that that moment in 2014 was kind of all about Laverne, is the way she framed it. And then she said, post-pose, because we're probably in a post-pose moment, even though pose is still in the air, it's about all of us. Jen Richards contended. And I like that because I think, and it was always my goal. I was very clear in 2014 that that moment was not about me and that it was about a community that I was a part of. It was about all the activists who had worked for years to create space for me to have that moment on the cover of Time magazine. And so now that is coming to fruition that more of our voices are being elevated and more perspectives. And um, it's taken a lot of pressure off me. I felt a lot of pressure in 2014, I got to tell you. Reflecting on that moment is, do you remember the criticism more than the celebration? I remember both. The cover was revealed on my birthday. 
So my birthday now is not only my birthday, but it's the anniversary of me being on the cover of Time magazine, which is pretty dope. And I decided that year, I said to myself, if I'm going to be on the cover of Time magazine, I need to have a party. And so, and if I, and if I wasn't going to be on the cover, if I was bumped for any reason, I was like, well, it could just be a birthday party. And so I had a party that year and Time magazine was, they were so generous that they gave us tons of copies of the magazine. And my boyfriend at the time had big posters made of the, of the magazine. I still have a poster of my Time magazine cover in my apartment. And I sent one to my mom and then we gave one, um, away for charity so we had a party and it was indeed a celebration there were tons of trans people at the party and some people from orange is new black were at the party and so i have fond memories of the celebration of the moment as well but i think both can exist but i'm all about both and that i can be in the celebration but then i can also critically reflect on the moment of course and so that cover as well as orange is new black at that time made you one of the most recognizable trans people in the world. Did you always know going into it that that would also require you to take on this educator role? No, <laughs> I certainly didn't know that. I mean, when I booked Orange is the New Black, I just hoped I could get another job from it. I mean, in 2012, I just thought I was doing a web series and people weren't really streaming shows. So it was, I was just happy to have a job, especially since I owed back rent. <laughs> so it was just happy to be able to pay my rent, if I'm being honest. But what I, I was clear, though, because I had done media work before Orange is the New Black, is that when I have a platform that I wanted to be able to change the conversation, elevate the conversation about and with trans people. And so I just felt it was my job as a person with a platform to challenge people to think differently about how we talk with and about trans people. And so I saw that happening. I saw you mm -hmm. actively changing the conversation and moving it away from surgeries and the transition to about the the other parts of the trans experience that we don't talk enough about. Mm -hmm. That was you working alone and knowing that that was important and not part of like a larger mission? I never feel like it's alone. I feel like I had a lot of support from my community and came out of an activist community. And I had done a reality show in 2008 called I Wanna Work For Diddy. So I had been working with GLAAD for many years and um, in various capacities. I had been writing for the Huffington Post and going to Albany to talk to legislators about gender, the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act, which took years to pass. I had been going to marches. I had been, so I was engaged as an activist in my community. I had gone to the Philadelphia Trans Health Conference and done panels and, and so I was was, I, I was in my community, and so I didn't feel like I was alone doing it. I was certainly the person who was being publicized or the person who had the platform, but I didn't feel alone. Oh, and you also then felt prepared. I was prepared. I think the beauty of having my breakthrough moment as an actor that also coincided with the advocacy work that I was doing, having that breakthrough moment over 40 and after sort of struggling in New York City to be an actor for over 20 years, I was prepared. I was prepared as an artist and I was also prepared as a human being to be able to, and barely, and can I tell you barely? Because I, there's nothing can fully prepare you for to be famous and to have people recognize you on the street and all the criticism that comes with that. Nothing can really fully prepare you for that, but I was way more prepared than I would have been 10 years earlier before the lovely therapist I have now and the, you know, all the lovely um, sort of tools and um, work I've done on myself to build shame resilience, to build trauma resilience, to just be able to exist in the world in my own skin with a sense of worthiness. I think we see a lot of young people become famous at really young ages and we see them go crazy and I so get it now. It's really, really hard if you don't know who you are and all of a sudden the world is telling you who you are. If you do not have a sense already of who you are and then all of a sudden you're famous, I think that is a that's very, very dangerous. And then they're making mistakes in public, whereas yeah. we got to do it in private. Oh, all the things I did. Oh, my goodness, if it were on Instagram, it would be terrible. But yeah, I, 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 luckily, I, I lived a very full life, too. Before. <laughs> what, what does that mean? Girl. <laughs> I've lived, and I've, and I've made my mistakes, and... And luckily, I didn't have to do that. In the, and I've made mistakes in the public eyes, certainly as well. But I hadn't all the things that I did when I was younger that young people should do. Yeah, um, it wasn't pub it wasn't on Instagram or in on TMZ or whatever. Yeah, and that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I was a mess. I was a mess. But I, I'm 
I'm glad I got to be a mess. It's important to be a mess and have like the opportunity to be it. Absolutely, because that's how you learn. I don't. I think I've learned more from my quote unquote mistakes than I have from when I've done things well. I labeled you as an educator, helping to educate the public on the trans experience. Do you still find that you're being asked questions in interviews? What is trans? How is it different than being gay? And like those like one-on-one level questions? No. What, I, what I'm most excited about now at this stage of my career is I do tons of interviews now and don't even talk about being trans or I'm not asked about it. I'll bring it up because I love being trans. And I, I, I think it's important to continue to talk about it, continue, particularly considering what's going on in the world with trans folks. But no, it's, it's, it, the conversation has shifted. Certainly there are folks who have not, are not on board with the shift in the conversation. And so there's some, still, there's some one-on-one still happening. But I'm really at a place now in my life, I was thinking about this um, now as I um, prepare to talk more about uh, the Title VII cases going to the Supreme Court October 8th. And there are, there are amicus briefs that are being sort of submitted to the Supreme Court by folks who think it should be legal to discriminate against the LGBTQ plus community in employment. And they're basically sort of debating the legitimacy of trans people, right? That, that, that there's no such thing as being non-binary or trans. And I'm just like, I'm not interested in debating my identity or existence anymore. At stake with Title VII is really, is it legal to discriminate against LGBTQ people? We actually do exist. And, you know, the desires to define sex, right? Because the, the um, Title VII bans discrimination on the basis of sex and employment. And so the opponents of us having equal rights are basically saying that Title VII does not cover gender identity or sexual orientation and that sex should be defined in this very specific way. And so they're trying to have a conversation about how we define sex. And I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is, it, should it be legal to discriminate against anyone in this country? And I say no. So I'm just done debating my existence. I'm done debating whether trans is real. I'm real. I, I'm, I'm sitting here and I have lived experiences as a woman, as a woman of trans experience, as a black woman, and my community does. And so I, I'm just, I'm done with that. And I know a lot of trans folks are done with that. Now let's get to the place of we are being discriminated against. Amy Stevens was informed her employer that she was going to be transitioning and returning to work. She wrote a brilliantly beautiful letter. I think the letter, um, I read the letter for a friend of mine. There's going to be a video of different folks reading the letters coming out soon. And she was fired. She was fired simply, and her employer does not dispute that he fired her because she said, I'm coming to work as my authentic self. That should not be legal in the United States of America. We don't need to debate trans existence. We need to say that we shouldn't be discriminating against people because of who they are. And that's the case going for the Supreme Court in October. October 8th, yes. Amy Stevens Gates and two other cases of two gay men who were also fired um, from their jobs simply for being gay. You know, for all the work we still have to do, I think that one of the victories of the movement is that trans people used to be told you transition and then you go and like live stealth you never yes. reveal you transitioned yes. and that no longer is the like only prescription no 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 not at all i mean in 1998 when i started my medical transition that was what i wanted to do that's what the women i admired and and um were inspired to transition the, the, the women who inspired me to transition that's what they did that's what we were supposed to do but that wasn't an option for me i never blended in i was never there was always i would always enter spaces in someone but no i was trans and so i had to get to a point where i was comfortable with people knowing that i was trans i had to get to a point where i was comfortable owning my transness trans beautiful came out of that in part me this effort for me to be able to say to myself and say to the world I'm trans and that's beautiful and there's nothing wrong with that and I should not be denied a job for that I should not be denied love and access um, because I'm trans and with these safety issues that come with being trans you have a different sort of trans visibility now as a celebrity who's Mm -hmm. known for being trans does that does that um make you a bigger target or does that give you protection? Both and. I have to be really, really careful what I do and say. And even I have these, I'm feeling very free in this interview and I'm like, oh, did I say something I shouldn't have said that could negatively impact my community? Those are things I'm constantly thinking about. And so because if Laverne does it, then it's like it can reflect badly on my entire community. And that is a pressure that is real. So yes, I'm a target in that way. I've been very blessed, knock on wood, that um. 
that there's just been so much love in my life as I travel and as I work and on different sets and in different countries that so far there has been um it's just been a lot of love and so I feel very very blessed and I'm and I'm someone who has felt physically unsafe most of my life lots of childhood trauma around physical assault sexual assault walking the streets of New York as a, a recognizably trans person a lot of um, danger that I've been in most of my life and so safety is something that I think is contextual I think sometimes it's, it's in our heads sometimes it's, it's circumstantial the trauma of of what I've experienced throughout my life doesn't magically go away because I'm a recognizable actress now. Um, so there's trauma there that I still have to sort of work to build resilience around. And I'm still super careful. You know, I'm just programmed as a New Yorker, I think, to sort of just always be hyper aware and hyper vigilant of my surroundings. So if someone's coming at you, you have to figure out, is this person going to attack me or are they my biggest fan? I've had moments er, very early on when I um, was beginning to be recognized more just New Black. I, there was that definitely, this was like 2013, and I was not used to being recognized on the street, but I was used to being called out on the street, misgendered, assaulted on the street verbally and physically. And so when strangers would run up to me on the street in the beginning, actually it's still, it's scary. It scares the 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 Jesus out of me. I was walking on 14th Street once. I was leaving one of the wig stores on 14th Street. <laughs> As you know, you got girls got to get her her bundles. And all of a sudden, I felt this person running up behind me, screaming. And then she grabbed me, and I just I started screaming, and I started running. And it was just so instinctive. It's the fight, flight, or freeze thing. And so, and then I and then she was like, "I love you." As I'm running away from her, <laughs> and I was just like so scared and like I even now I'm just thinking like this was this fan who like loved the work and I'm like running from her on the street because like someone just ran up on me on 14th street in New York and like when that has happened to me before oh my goodness it just even brings up a lot of emotion for me now so that is the thing that I I don't know if our my fans always understand that um I don't always feel safe I remember I was I went to um I could have a zillion of these stories I don't need to tell you another one but like there have been many situations I've been in where I've just kind of felt a little traumatized because crowds scare me and just there's a whole history of me not really being safe in my life so these are things I have to work on and I have a great therapist but then there's I have to I don't know it's a process with all that stuff and so you've said that you were harassed on the street in New York City every day living there yeah did that only change when you started becoming famous well, it didn't change when I became famous. I remember I was I was going to a hotel bar to be interviewed for, I was in the cover of this magazine called Bustle in 2015. And as I entered the hotel, someone called me a man as I was entering the hotel. So I was like sort of called out, I was being called a man and like screw the sky scream when people do this to trans people it's not like that's a, that's a man it's like not a whisper it's like they scream it and they want everybody to sort of know within like a five mile radius and then people start looking and then it's not just that's a man like it's like get the f out of here it's like i'm walking into a, a hotel there's this whole sort of becomes like because i'm walking on the street it often becomes this thing of like get the f out of here i'm like i'm walking on the street it's like they, they want me not to be walking down the street as myself like trying to get from point A to point B. It's like, get the F out of here. And that, that's, I mean, so it's like not just the misgendering. It's like the demeaning, like you should not exist on this, on this street corner kind of thing. And so I'm like going to be interviewed for a cover story for a magazine and being harassed and misgendered as I go in. I mean, I have my incognito look where I, um, when I travel now, which helps. Um, but yeah, it still, it still happens. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. Can I tell you though what is so wonderful when I don't when I don't feel like my safety is threatened that I'm just like bless your heart you know I'm able to if I don't feel you know that I'm in danger I'm just able to say bless their hearts and I pray for them because that's clearly not about me it's about them you know and I think when I don't feel safe then it's a different issue and there's trans people out, out there right now who experience that and are not safe when it happens and so we I don't know what we can begin to do to make it safer for tra- I've been I mean I've been talking about this for years we've been sort of experiencing the murders of trans people particularly trans women of color for years in record numbers and 
trans folks are saying, stop killing us. And it's just, I don't, I don't really know what we can begin to do as a culture to stop the violence against trans people. Um, and that, that is very disturbing. <sighs> a dear friend of mine who, um, has pa- who passed away from, oh, I don't want to cry. Oh, gosh. Anyway, a dear friend of mine who passed away from um, HIV AIDS, um, they didn't get treatment because they were so, they, no, no one knew that they were HIV positive. They didn't want to tell anybody because of the stigma and the shame. And they could still be alive if it weren't for that stigma. We got to let go of the stigma. We really do. I have such incredible friends who are living with HIV, who are undetectable and living these incredible lives because they have access to medication. And I want to celebrate those friends. That's one another reason I um, wanted to partner with Band-Aid and Red to celebrate all my friends who are HIV positive, the members of my community who are, who are so resilient and amazing and strong with the, in the face of this stigma. And just continue to let people know that you don't, you don't have to die from HIV and AIDS anymore. You, it need not be a death sentence, but folks just need access to medication. And that's what Red is doing, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. But that is some, that conversation that we need to be having more of here. There Need, we need to lift the stigma of HIV AIDS. It's not a death sentence. We can actually work to end AIDS. That We can work to end it, which is incredible. And we have proof of that with like cities like San Francisco, which is on track to have zero new transmissions. Mm-hmm. And I think like it's so glaring that this is a, like a predominantly white gay city compared to sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, and so the, so the work... For around communities of color, the work for my trans community, there's a whole different kind of conversation that we need to be having around safety as trans folks and trans people of color, particularly because our partners. It's a whole other kind of conversation. I, I've I've had friends who are, I have half friends who are trans, and then they are dating people who. May, may or may not know that they're trans and then are, are not concerned about condom use when they don't know the person's trans, but then they find out the person's trans and then all of a sudden the condom use comes up and so there becomes a stigma around being trans and the assumptions that we make around um, HIV status. So there's still a lot of education that we need to have around these issues and, and I'm here for that. I think it's really good for people to hear that, you know, Laverne Cox, who has this label transgender icon attached to her, also is, it's true, it's true, you know it's true, (laughs) Um, that she's also dealing with the trauma of, like, her community and the trauma of, like, her her past in New York City and everything. Like, that doesn't go away. No. And I think, too, I just, I've been doing a lot of work to heal from when I, you know, sort of went through puberty and was coming, coming to age around my own sexuality, AIDS was a reality. And so AIDS has been a reality my entire sexual life. And so for many years, because I grew up religious and I internalized so much transphobia and homophobia, I associated with sex with um, getting AIDS and dying. And so there was so much shame and stigma attached. And so to do the work to sort of separate those things has been has been work. Um, it's been um, a lot of therapy, um, Luckily, being with um, partners who have been healing around all that. And so not having a stigma attached to, I think, a lot of LGBT people, maybe not now as much, maybe miss my age group. Hopefully, fewer LGBTQ people are growing up with this sort of stigma around their sexuality. But I grew up with a lot of that, that I've had to do a lot of work to unlearn. I agree. Um, one more question. Yes. There you go. Uh, you've done so much. You're still young. Like, what do you have left to do? Oh my God! There's so much, so much activist work that has to be done, and I and I'm really in partnership with um, folks on the ground doing that work. I've yet to have something scripted that I produce on the air. We're in the process of we have some stuff in development. We'll see. So I want to be a producer on in the scripted capacity. I produced documentaries and have a daytime Emmy for a documentary I produced. And so. Um, yeah, producing scripted um, projects as a vehicle for myself as an actor and for other actors. I want to do Broadway eventually when the right um, role comes along. 
you surprised me because I saw you sing about a year ago at um, something that Our Lady J produced. Oh, yes. And you sang opera. Yes. I, I don't know if people like, know that you're an opera singer. I, I feel like an opera singer in training. I was just at a voice lesson yesterday. with I just have got a new teacher here in L.A. because it's just one of the things I do. I say for fun, but yesterday's lesson was not fun because my teacher's trying to get a lot, get me out of a lot of old bad habits that is just time to let go of. So singing opera is really, really hard. <laughs> it looks like and it. It's insanely hard, but it's fun to have have a challenge. And so I look forward to continuing to be challenged by the work that I do um, with my opera singing hobby, but also my work as an actor. I want to get better. And so um, I have a wonderful coach here, and there's some wonderful roles coming up that are going to require a lot of me and I and I'm looking forward to rising to the occasion and getting better at what I do. And so I think ultimately that is what right when I mean I want to get some shows on the air and produce things, but I just want to get better at everything. And so that is a tremendous amount of work and discipline. So I need to become more disciplined as well. That's an amazing place to leave it on. Uh-huh. Thank you. Thank you. And that was Laverne Cox. You can see her narrating the documentary Disclosure on Netflix, which she also executive produced. Last week, we spoke with Sam Fader, the film's director, so make sure you check that out. And if you've not yet, please subscribe to this podcast and help us spread the word. Doing things like that by posting on Twitter or Instagram, maybe even Facebook. Remember Facebook? Doing things like that really are some of the biggest ways you can help our show grow. So thank you so much to everyone who does that. We are produced by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and I'll see you next week.